from blatant eye gouging to trying to rip your opponent's knee apart, we're bringing you some of the most disgusting examples of terrible sportsmanship in MMA that we could find. And to kick things off, we have a UFC title fight finish that left a bad taste in everyone's mouth. John Jones deserves all the credit in the world for how he adapted to the odd karate style of Lyoto Machida and came back from an uncertain round one to finish the dragon in round two. But when he caught the former champ in that standing guillotine and just let his unconscious body drop to the floor, indeed, it was a cold, badass moment. But that was a highly disrespectful thing to do to such an esteemed championship level icon. However, things get even worse for our next entry and a later appearance from UFC 1 finalist Gerard Gordo. In a tight clinch exchange with his opponent Yuki Nakai, Gordo was filmed very clearly gouging at his opponent's eyes when the ref wasn't looking. That's a dirty move, right? Well, to make things worse, Nakai actually lost all sight in one of his eyes after this fight, giving the event a much darker conclusion. You guys ever heard of Husimar Palhares? Well, on the surface, he's a talented grappler with a mastery of leg locks. But for some reason, this dude refuses to let go of subs. And his reputation for destroying limbs has caused him to be blacklisted by most serious promoters. And when he caught Jake Shields in a Kimura, those extra milliseconds of torquing on his arm could have done immense damage. This guy is a total barbarian in there. Look up the term dirty fighter in the dictionary and you'll likely find a picture of Gilbert Ivel staring back at you. This dude is an all-timer when it comes to fouls and getting himself DQ'd. And he even let his infamous rage get the better of him by KOing a referee who he felt was trying to fix one of his fights. Ivel even kicked him when he was down just to make sure he had gotten his point across. Sure, this Finland-based ref was clearly corrupt and doing his utmost to screw Ivel out of a win. But was it all really worth it? That's the question. Very few MMA promoters in the world would go near this dude after this massive controversy. And can you really blame them? Karma can come around very quickly in MMA. And when Eric Silva faked a glove touch only to swipe at Nordin Taleb with a big hook, it was clear that he wasn't going to win any fans. Thankfully, the MMA gods blessed Taleb with the ability to KO him shortly after. Eric Silva went from one of the most promising prospects in all of MMA to a real mid-level talent who could just never put it all together. All in all, justice was served in the octagon on this day. This next one is a real two-for-one kind of deal. Josh Koscheck very clearly faked being hit by an illegal knee just to get a point docked from Paul Daly before then lying on top of him for three rounds. Oh, wait a minute. They didn't even hit him. You'd be angry too, right? Well, Daly then proceeded to ruin his UFC career by sucker punching Koshek after the bell. And yes, he lost his contract. And to this day, it's the moment that Daly is unfortunately best known for. Next up, in Ahmed al-Darmaki, we have one of the biggest idiots to ever lace up gloves and fight. Firstly, this dude refused to let go of a rear naked choke that he had successfully used to win his fight. But then, he decided to have a go at the comparatively massive veteran referee Mark Goddard, making himself look like the biggest crybaby to ever grace an MMA cage. Who knows what he was thinking, but he hasn't been seen in MMA since. Okay, so this one is quite interesting. Depending on which side of the fence you fall on, this could be a case of two guys being at fault or some well-deserved justice being handed out. Heath Herring was getting ready to take on Yoshihiro Nakao when the Japanese heavyweight decided to plant a kiss right on his lips during the stare down. Herring immediately responded by KOing him there and then. Right or wrong, it was most certainly Nakao who was at fault more. How Priscilla Cachoeira is still in the UFC after this, we do not know. Her blatant eye gouges against Jillian Robertson were simply disgusting. She used them in an attempt to get out of a submission, and somehow she's still in the promotion, having competed three times since then. An all-time dirty move inside the cage. Okay, so this one isn't technically against the rules, but coming from a guy like John Jones, it's easy to look at his intent here as pretty obvious bad sportsmanship. 
When he faced off against the future UFC light heavyweight champion Glover Teixeira, he immediately began looking for opportunities to limit the Brazilian contender's power. And so, when he caught Glover in the clinch, he started to bend his arm awkwardly out, hoping to snap it or at the very least make it ineffective from there onwards. Again, it's not illegal, but man, John Jones has a real underlying cruelty to him. That much is clear. Shinya Aoki is a bona fide legend of Japanese MMA, an icon whose submission game made him one of the finest lightweights on the planet during his prime. But when he took on fierce rival Mizuto Hirota, he left with a black mark on his legacy that he might never live down. After breaking Hirota's arm with a submission, Aoki decided to immediately rub it in his opponent's face, flipping the bird at him as he howled in agony before then doing the same to his coaches. And he did this all with a maniacal grin on his face. That's one cold dude right there. As time goes on, the MMA fan base are becoming more and more aware of the fact that Israel Adesanya is a very weird guy. And after putting on a dominant performance against Paulo Costa that saw the Brazilian totally shut down from the first bell to the second round TKO, he decided to celebrate in a way that can only be described as, well, a little over the top. Naturally, Costa didn't know what happened at the time, but when he found out, to say he was furious was an understatement. Just how far can you take things when it comes to punishing someone who has trash-talked you? Well, it's not like Ben Askren was crossing too many lines in the build-up to his fight with Jorge Masvidal. But when you make an enemy of a guy like Game Bread, the consequences are always going to be high. So when Jorge finished the fight in a record-breaking five seconds with a huge flying knee, his super-necessary follow-up punches and the mocking celebration seemed extremely cruel. But hey, that's just Masvidal. He doesn't take kindly to disrespect, that's for sure. Bad sportsmanship can come in many forms, but for Ronda Rousey, it was something as simple as not making peace with a fierce rival after a hard-fought battle. Misha Tate had just survived way longer than any of Ronda's previous opponents, but when the third round armbar came, her attempts to shake the hand of her opponent were left with total rejection from the bantamweight queen. Rousey was a bad winner, but time would eventually show us that she was an even worse loser. This one right here is on a different level. Takeo Shinya managed to win his fight fair and square with a knockout blow, but in that moment he decided he wasn't done and proceeded to keep hitting his opponent. And when the ref tried to stop him, he hit him as well. It was a scene of total chaos and evidence that Shinya was about to burn all of his bridges within the sport. Eventually, Shinya was restrained, but this is one of the worst post-fight moments you will ever see in mixed martial arts. TJ Dillashaw is one insanely competitive dude. His reputation as a bit of a jerk in the gym translated to a heated feud with his former teammate Cody Garbrandt. And when they met for the bantamweight title at UFC 217, Dillashaw's eventual TKO win came with some added personal meaning. And in that moment, he couldn't help himself but roar like a maniac in the clearly concussed Garbrandt's face. Call it a warranted release of energy if you like, but it's definitely not good sportsmanship in our book. Okay, so this one on the surface looks pretty bad. Keith Hackney was trying to fight his way out of Joe Sun's grip. And because the early rule set of the UFC was so loose, hitting your opponent in the groin was actually legal. And so, that's exactly what he did. But here's the thing, if you feel bad for Joe-san, just know that he's currently in jail for the most horrific of crimes, which we can't even get into without risking demonetization. So we're not too mad at Hackney here, in fact, some might say that Joe-san deserves worse. And finally, we come to another guy whose reputation as a dirty fighter precedes him. Mike Kyle had gotten into a pretty heated feud with Brian Olsen ahead of his fight, and despite getting what looked like a perfectly good TKO victory, Kyle decided that he was not finished. And after pushing the ref out of the way, he went back in to land several more shots, eventually getting his win overturned to a DQ loss. A reputation-destroying performance makes you wonder just what was going through this guy's mind. And we're coming out of the gates with one of the most insane incidents you will ever see in an MMA cage. 
Takeo Shina had just managed to score a fantastic knockout victory, but instead of wheeling off in celebration following this huge moment, he decided that he wasn't done fighting. Shina, for whatever reason, just kept hammering punches down on his opponent. And when the ref tried to jump in there and stop him, he was met by a huge knee to his midsection. Eventually, Shina was restrained and this skirmish was brought to an end. But man, you're not likely to see an uglier post-fight scene in this sport. Thankfully, Shina never competed in MMA again, and to be fair, what commission would ever license this guy after a display like that? The veteran referee Mark Goddard has a habit of finding himself in situations like this. Who knows why, but this won't be his only appearance in this video. Ahmed al-Darmaki had seemingly done enough to register a highly impressive submission win, but for some reason he didn't let go of the sub when Goddard tried to loosen his grip. And then, to make matters worse, he started pushing the ref in frustration. Goddard, to his credit, kept his cool, despite being twice the size of al-Darmaki and probably capable of squishing him if he so desired. But in the end, this unruly fighter had his win overturned to a DQ loss for getting physical with the ref, and we certainly agree that it was the right call. This next one is a little different. This guy did not mean to land a shot on this referee and drop him to the canvas. But hey, if you're gonna KO a ref, you might as well do it in style. And for this amateur fighter competing at the IMMAFs, oh, he managed to land a rolling thunder kick that bad. caught this ref clean. Sure, it would have been nicer if it actually landed on his intended target, but this guy managed to carve out his own unique slice of MMA history with this one. You gotta feel for the referee though, that's definitely a concussion right there. But for as much as the last one was accidental, there was nothing unplanned about this next one. No, this tense scene kicked off directly after this fight had ended, and who knows what exactly caused these two to clash. But this fighter clearly took issue with the referee, and before anyone knew what was happening, they had nearly started a full-on brawl. But this ref wasn't backing down, and was not intimidated by the pro fighter that stood before him. Not all refs are equal in terms of fighting prowess, but this guy was certainly better than most. We're dealing with a wide range of incidents here. The intentional ref attacks, the not so intentional ones. But how about the semi-conscious submission attempt? Well, this guy got flattened within the opening 10 seconds of his fight, eating a front kick to the face before a barrage of punches put him down. But in his dazed and confused state, he came back to life and tried to score a submission on the only thing he could grab a hold of, the referee. Thankfully, his team made a beeline towards him to try and prevent any unwanted chaos. And we're sure the ref himself took it in good spirits. These things happen in MMA, I guess. When you're forced to sign on the dotted line and fight someone you're friendly with outside the cage, it's not an easy thing to do. And for Justin Gagey, we're sure there were dozens of fighters he would have rather competed against than his friend Donald Cerrone. So when Gagey managed to score the TKO in the first round and was made to land a few more ground and pound shots than he would have liked, he let out his frustration towards the ref, lashing out at him for what he perceived to be a late stoppage. The highlight is one of the most passionate warriors in the sport, and to say he wears his heart on his sleeve would be putting it lightly. Another classic concussed fighter moment up next this time with a leg lock attempt that could have done serious damage to the ref's limbs had he not tapped out and saved himself. You gotta feel for this fighter though. No one wants to go viral for something they did in a confused state. But damn, his opponent didn't even try to help the ref. He just stood there taunting both of them. A bizarre fight ending sequence and proof that these referees really do need to have some BJJ skill in their arsenal. This next one was a legitimately emotional reaction, and while you should never strike a referee, at the same time, you can kinda see why this fighter was so angry. Who knows what this ref was thinking, but he was watching a very basic and easy to understand BJJ sequence playing out. Seriously, there was nothing complicated about it. This guy had his opponent's back, and once he sunk in that rear naked choke, the tap came shortly after. 
but for some bizarre reason, the ref ignored this very clear tap and let the dude hang out in the choke for another few seconds until the fighter applying the sub mercifully let go. When the losing fighter got to his feet, he immediately went after the ref for putting him in such danger. Again, we're not condoning violence against fight officials, but man, what was he thinking? Another case of taking on a friend inside the cage and the type of emotions that can bring to the surface. For Roy Nelson, a man who was without question one of the hardest punchers in MMA history, he knew full well what the consequences could be for every additional punch he landed on Antonio Bigfoot Silva. As a friend of Silva's, he was pretty upset that the ref, Big John McCarthy, failed to realize that the fight was over. A puncher like Big Country Nelson delivers insane force with every single hammer blow. And so, by the time the TKO came, it was a late one in Nelson's eyes. In his rage, he kicked out at the ref in anger, although he did later apologize for his actions. I can't, I can't apologize no, enough to John McCarthy, the commission, and the MMA fans around the world. John Fitch, during his prime, had one hell of a top game. So much so that many fans consider his style of fighting boring. His intended target, Big Rig Hendrix, was already off celebrating this massive victory. When a clearly concussed and extremely disoriented fighter is swinging punches at a referee, it's helpful when that referee just so happens to be a former UFC-level fighter. And sure enough, this dude came out throwing bombs at Frank the Tank Camacho during this regional level event, and thankfully Camacho was able to very calmly deal with the situation, showcasing his pro-level defense. He didn't take it to heart either, showing total understanding to the fighter once he had calmed himself down. That's the sign of a great referee, folks. Not all refs bring Camacho's proven resume to the table, but the more ex-fighters we see officiating fights, the better. This one was the biggest news in combat sports for a time. During the peak of Conor McGregor's very public fall from grace following his fight with Floyd Mayweather, he attended a Bellator event in his hometown of Dublin, Ireland. And after witnessing his longtime friend and teammate Charlie Ward scoring a huge KO in front of a packed three arena, Connor totally abandoned all sense, hopping over the side of the cage immediately to congratulate Ward on his win. The problem? Well, Mark Goddard wasn't finished tending to the beaten fighter, and usually the ref takes a few seconds before anyone is allowed in. So, when this longtime referee called out Connor for his lack of professionalism, McGregor went over and actually shoved Goddard. As you might expect, the Irishman was ejected from the venue, and on that Sunday morning, Dana White was no doubt furious that his biggest star had drawn so much attention to Bellator. We've shown some decent referee submission defense in this video so far, but how about the takedown defense from this official? After one of these fighters got put out thanks to this choke, the ref was forced to defend against a single leg from this confused fighter, balancing on one leg like a prime Jose Aldo to avoid conceding the takedown. Like many of the other clips we featured, this was not an intentional attack at all. But hey, it's not often a ref gets to show off their skills. And finally, we've come to maybe the most famous example of them all the ill-fated trip to Finland that saw one of MMA's dirtiest fighters, Gilbert Ivel, lose control inside the cage. According to Ivel, he was brought in to lose this fight, set up with an opponent who had ties to the promoter and the referee. And after being unfairly cautioned against working in the clinch by the ref, which makes zero sense, Ivel snapped and knocked the ref out. This was one of the most infamous moments in MMA history, one that made sure the name Gilbert Ivel would be remembered long after he stopped fighting. Was it right for Ivel to be brought in to lose like this? No, definitely not. But his reaction was totally insane. There's no denying it. We kick things off with perhaps the most famous disqualification in the history of the MMA, or at least the most impactful in terms of the market left. John Jones has certainly had tough nights in the UFC octagon, but to this day he has yet to suffer a legitimate loss as a pro. Unless you read his record on paper, that is. 
The sole defeat of Johnny Bones Jones' career came when he took on Matt Hommel during his initial rise through the light heavyweight ranks, and it was a pretty straightforward victory, one that could have ended by dominant TKO when Jones achieved mount and proceeded to rain down with a flurry of elbows. The problem? Well, some of those elbows were illegal 12 to 6 elbows, and as a result, Jones was immediately handed a DQ loss, leaving Hommel with a rare victory over one of the greatest fighters to ever do it. Eric Silva There was a time when Eric Silva was considered one of the most legitimately dangerous prospects in the entire sport. However, that time did not last long and once his game was figured out, boy, did the wheels fall off. But this matchup with Carlo Prater came before this hype train died down, and when Silva managed to blitz and score a knockdown in one of the earliest exchanges, it looked like he was on his way towards a memorable win. And when the TKO came, it looked like a definitive one. But it became very clear that Silva had landed multiple shots on the back of his opponent's head, causing the result to be immediately ruled as a DQ loss. Joe Rogan's cage-side confusion and his bizarre decision to stage a post-fight interview didn't help, but this was certainly a clear-cut example of how not to finish someone. Piotr Jan Carving out your own unique slice of UFC history can only be a good thing for your legacy, right? Psst, title fights. Michael Perietta. Speaking of weird fights, who on earth thought it was a good idea to set Diego Sanchez up for a showdown with Michael Perietta? Sanchez is a legend, but he was clearly on the decline in more ways than one when he decided to take this fight. So, when Perietta landed a very obvious illegal knee on Diego after dominating the matchup, Sanchez found himself in an interesting position. No one can doubt Diego's fighting spirit, or at least the spirit he possessed in his prime. But when he asked the officials for clarification on what would happen if he decided to give up, it was pretty clear that he wanted to get out of there. And so, the fight's results stood as a DQ victory for the Ultimate Fighter winner, a bizarre fight that probably shouldn't have happened. Alexei Efremov Another good old-fashioned illegal knee comes in next, courtesy of yet another fighter who probably should have known better. This one is actually pretty hard to understand. Not only was Alexei Efremov doing well in the fight, but he had his opponent up against the cage in a bad spot with all the time in the world to think about his next move. Hell, he could have even asked the referee if his target was technically grounded before unloading a series of illegal knees. But no, he threw caution to the wind and came away with a viral disqualification loss for his efforts. Greg Hardy Greg Hardy's UFC career was interesting, to say the least. After being drafted into the top flight on the back of his name and clear athleticism, Hardy struggled to latch on to the intricacies of MMA, and eventually he received his marching orders after a spell of tough losses. But when he got a win of his overturned for using an inhaler in between rounds, yeah, this was just another level of shocking. Seriously, we don't know whether to blame Hardy himself or his coaches more an all-timer in terms of mid-fight stupidity that deserves to be ridiculed in videos like this one. Anderson Silva Some of you might not be aware of this rather famous DQ in the early years of the great Anderson Silva's career. Taking on his future UFC opponent Yushin Okami, this was a pretty straightforward battle up until Okami established top position against the grounded Silva. With the famously tricky guard of the Brazilian beneath him, Yushin decided to posture up to avoid any slick submission attempts. Out of nowhere, Anderson fired off a beautiful but totally illegal upkick that caught his opponent right on the chin, knocking him down. And while the commentators openly gushed over this amazing knockout win that Silva had just scored, it became very clear that it was not all what it seemed. Okami was very obviously grounded when the shot landed, and as a result, Silva was handed the disqualification loss. David Osdaba We're going to cover a wide range of DQs in this video, from illegal shots to bizarre mix-ups and just blatant cheating. But a DQ due to timidity? That's one you don't see often. When a pair of fighters sign on the dotted line to compete, they are expected to, you know, fight. But when David Ozdaba took on the gargantuan Lithuanian Robert Bomieka, it seemed like he was absolutely terrified of engaging him. 
And sure, to the average Joe, the sight of this absolute behemoth of a man would be terrifying. But to this professional fighter, it's fair to expect that he would at least try to win. However, a small chance of victory was clearly not enough to entice him to give it a shot. And so, he decided to avoid all contact instead, eventually forcing the referee to jump in and declare the bout to be over. Sure, he probably saved a few brain cells, but his pride will forever be hurt by this showing. Alex Andrade The UFC used to be a very different place in its early days, and when Alex Andrade decided to compete in the octagon wearing a pair of shoes, that was A-OK -okay according to the rules. The only caveat was that he would not, under any circumstances, be allowed to throw a kick at his opponent. Makes sense, right? The dude is wearing shoes for Pete's sake. But when the fight began, Andrade, for some strange reason, kept throwing kicks, totally ignoring every warning that was given to him by the referee. He then acted all surprised when he was landed with a DQ. Just a totally silly turn of events in a fight that he could have actually won if he hadn't resorted to such a terrible attempt at cheating. Heath Herring We've seen a wide variety of DQs so far, but this one is truly in a league of its own. When Heath Herring took on Yoshihiro Nakao in Japan, all pre-fight predictions were left totally ruined when Nakao decided to plant a kiss on Herring's lip during their stare-down. And to say that Herring did not appreciate that would be putting it lightly. Instead of waiting for just a few more seconds to get his revenge, Herring decided to put him out cold there and then. Was it an understandable response? Well, we'll let you be the judge of that. Nakao certainly drew first blood, but Herring definitely took matters into his own hands. A memorable DQ and a unique one to boot. Ahmed al Darmaki. Want to get yourself blacklisted from pretty much the entire MMA world? Well, then do exactly what Ahmed Al Darmaki did after a win under the UAE Warriors banner. Al Darmaki managed to lock up a pretty solid rear naked choke to force the tap from his opponent. But even as referee Mark Goddard tried to pry his grip free, Ahmed would not budge. Who knows what he was thinking, but it gets worse. Not only did Al Darmaki not immediately apologize for what he had done, but instead he went on the offensive, pushing the veteran referee several times before trying to celebrate like nothing was wrong. Thankfully, his win was immediately overturned, and to date, Ahmed Al Darmaki has not made another appearance in the sport of mixed martial arts. A very odd temper tantrum from a guy who should have been wheeling away in victory. Gilbert Ivel. Look up the term dirty fighter and you'll likely see a picture of Gilbert Ivel staring back at you. And while this Dutchman has had more than a few incidents over the years, by far and away the most famous example came when he took on Ate Bakman in Helsinki, Finland. Now to be fair, while Ivel has indeed been guilty of many dirty moments over the years, it does seem as though he was being flown over and set up to lose. By his account, his opponent, the referee, and the opposition manager were all working together, and in the earliest stages of the fight, the ref kept breaking up perfectly legal clinches. This was done to deprive Ivel of one of his greatest advantages, and of course, it sent him into a rage. So, what did he do? He KO'd the ref, of course, ending the fight there and then with one of the wildest moments the sport has ever known. Number 11, Hinata Sabral. In an earlier UFC 75 conference call recap, Hinata Babalu Sabral has been dropped from the UFC following his actions at that past Saturday UFC 74 event. UFC President Dana White confirmed that the fighter had been cut from his contract and after initially refusing to break a chokehold on opponent David Heath and then admitting it during a post-fight interview, Sabral told the sold-out crowd in the Mandalay Bay Event Center that he wanted to teach Heath a lesson for disrespecting him during the previous day weigh-ins. After dominating much of the fight and opening a gash Along the fighter's forehead, Sabral secured a fight ending Anaconda choke in the second round. However, after Heath tapped, Sabral refused to break the hold even as referee Steve Matsugati tugged on his arm. So what, what you're saying is that you put him to sleep on purpose even though you knew that he tapped. He has to learn his back. Take a look at the Mickey's Number 10, Atman Azetar. Azetar was due to take on Matt Favola in a lightweight contest at UFC 257 on the main card, but the UFC announced that the bout had been cancelled shortly before the weigh-ins because the German-Moroccan fighter had quote-unquote violated safety measures. 
Dana White later alleged Azatar and his team had removed the wristbands which allowed them to roam freely around the biosecure bubble in an apparent attempt to smuggle somebody into the safe zone. And then left. Now when security tried to stop him, he wouldn't stop either way. And uh... The UFC routinely tests everyone involved in the buildup to an event, from fighters to its own support staff, in a bid to continue amid the COVID-19 pandemic. And stringent safety measures are in place inside the bubble itself. While Azatar was a rising star in MMA with a 13-0 record, his indiscretion could have compromised a number of individuals and an incandescent white had taken the decision to boot the prospect out of the company. Yeah, it's just bad. He's gone. He's no longer a UFC fighter and uh, he's not fighting tonight. Number 9. Paul Daly It's not like Paul Daly is the only person to have ever wanted to take a swing at Josh Koscheck after a bout, he's just the only person to do it. At UFC 113 in 2010, Koscheck uses wrestling to defeat Daly. After three rounds of having Josh Koscheck on top of you, anyone is prone to a violent outburst. Long after the fighters had been separated following the end of the bout, Daly sucker punched Koscheck in the face. Dana White stated afterwards that Daly would never be back in the octagon. Dana, can I have you follow up on that incident? He's yeah. done. I don't give a shit if he's the best 170 pounder in the world. He'll never come back here again. We're talking Paul Daly. Yeah. You're cutting him from the USA. Yeah. He'll never come back. Daly has fought in the Zufa owned Strike Force promotion since White banned him, but never in the UFC. He is currently fighting Bellator. Number 8. Vanderlei Silva. While it would later be reduced, USADA originally handed the axe murderer a lifetime ban for fleeing a drug test. Silva happened to be filming a season of The Ultimate Fighter at the time, coaching opposite of Chael Sonnen. The uh, Nevada State Athletic Commission showed up at Vanderlei's gym to uh, do a random drug test, and uh, when he got there, he, uh, he ran out and jumped in his car and drove away, and then went MIA for a few days. Sonnen appeared on Joe Rogan's podcast and detailed the crazy set of events which led to Vanderlei originally being banned completely from the sport. His lifetime ban was eventually overturned, but following comments about the UFC and fight fixing, he was released and has never returned. Number 7. Ruslan Magomedov the Russian heavyweight was handed a lifetime ban for the UFC following multiple doping violations. His first sanction came in 2016, where he got a two-year ban when he tested positive for a selective androgen receptor modulator designed to help muscle growth. His second came in October 2018 when he tested positive for two steroid metabolites. The final straw came in February the following year when he refused to give a sample, the USADA banned him for life effectively making him never able to fight in the UFC again. Number 6. Jason High Dana White comes down heavily on infractions after the belt or altercation with referees and it was the latter that got him banned. Jason shoved referee Kevin Mulhall after disagreeing with the TKO stoppage in his bout against Rafael Dos Anjos in 2014. White said after the fight, he's cut, I'm gonna cut him, I look at the way Paul Daly put his hands on his opponent after a fight was over. You don't ever ever f cut your referee ever. You're done here, he's been apologizing on Twitter but he's done here. Number 5 Thiago Silva the UFC veteran was cut from the promotion following a serious incident in Florida where he allegedly threatened his estranged wife with a gun. It ended with a four-hour standoff with a SWAT team before he surrendered. He said he'd never fight in the UFC again when his SWAT team was around his house and things weren't looking too good for Tiago Silva. Makes you know? sense. Good point. That's legit. Uh, following his arrest, Dana White said Silva would never fight in the UFC again due to the incident. All criminal charges were later dropped, but he still never fought in the promotion again. Number 4. Caleb Starnes Caleb Starnes was a rising star in the UFC. He competed on The Ultimate Fighter, had secured a contract, beat Rory McDonald in his prime, and was on his way to being considered a top prospect. But Caleb was at the end of his contract and wanted one little thing added in his second contract that nobody else had. He wanted health insurance, and he was adamant about it. So adamant, in fact, he went out and threw a fight out of indignation, which got him banned from the UFC for life. If you're a professional fighter, it's a good thing to have the heart to fight. But the night Starnes fought Nate Quarry, he met a guy he just didn't want to engage with. Quarry mocked him throughout the fight doing the running man motion, but Starnes didn't care and spent 15 minutes literally backpedaling. It was pretty pathetic and the fight should have been stopped for timidity. And yes, that is in the textbook. Number 3. Matt Riddle Riddle had a 4 fight win streak in the UFC before two positive drug tests put an end to his career in the promotion. Although not officially banned, Dana White said he would never come back. 
White said, everybody's gonna have an excuse of why they were cut. Matt Riddle did an interview before the fight where he said, I smoke weed so that I don't beat my children. Then he tests positive for it. He's a fucking moron. Now, the reason he's not in the UFC anymore is because he could not pass a drug test. The guy couldn't pass a drug test. You have to go to work three times a year and you couldn't pass a drug test? Riddle later moved into wrestling and was signed by the WWE and performed on the NXT brand. Number two, BJ Penn. Penn is a legend in UFC and a former lightweight champion. He first fought in the promotion back in 2001 and has done a lot for the sport's popularity. He should have retired long ago and lost his last seven straight fights, the last in May 2019 and hasn't actually won since 2010. When videos emerged of the 41-year-old being involved in a street fight in Hawaii, Dana White said that that was it. He said, he won't fight again, that's it, that's a wrap, it's not even that this was the last straw. I didn't love him continuing to fight anyway, but with the relationship that he and I have, he gets me on the phone begging me for another fight, it's hard to turn him down. After what I saw in the video, BJ needs to, you know, he needs to focus on his personal life before he thinks about fighting. Number 1. Husamar Polares Husamar Polares' career was over, although he might have not been fully aware of that at this point. In 2013, after his second incident of holding a submission after the referee stepped in, the UFC fired Polares. He also failed a drug test in 2012, which UFC said contributed to his release. Dana White would later tell reporters Polares was banned from the UFC for life. With, uh, with Paul Harris, where he had the, uh, the lock and he didn't let it go. Finally, he let it go, but uh, yeah, I I'm going to cut him too. Polaris then signed with the World Series of Fighting. He immediately won the promotion's welterweight championship. Unfortunately, he would again hold a submission on after the referee stepped in during a bout with Jake Shields in 2015. He was handed a two-year suspension by the NSAC, but had fought twice in Europe since then, losing each bout. And that right there concludes his list. Let us know how he did in the comments below. All right, MMA fans, thank you so much for sticking around to the end of this video. If you enjoyed this video please give it a like make sure to hit the notification bell and don't forget to subscribe if you're new also don't forget to comment below what video you want to see next to kick things off we have a subject that remains a contentious issue within mma to this day not all promotions have banned the use of knees to a grounded opponent with one championship being a major example but the way the UFC decided to get rid of them and then blurred the lines between a legal shot and a foul by adopting new rules just a few years ago, yeah, it could get pretty crazy. The rule didn't exist at first in the UFC. Then, because of how bad a visual it was, they decided that a grounded fighter could be any fighter who lays a hand on the mat while standing. Nowadays, if you have anything other than your feet in a single hand down, you're technically grounded. So, whether it's two hands, one knee on the canvas, or both, you are completely safe from knee strikes. Unless you're fighting Aljamain Sterling, of course. This next one is pretty similar to the first. If mainstream audiences wouldn't get on board for knee strikes, you could bet your bottom dollar that soccer kicks and stomps would be a total no-go. Back in the days of pride, guys like Wanderlei Silva were renowned for their finishing ability by using soccer kicks and stomps on a vulnerable opponent. And while these were legal at first in the UFC back in the 90s, like most other crazy techniques, they were swiftly outlawed, never to return. Headbutting your opponent used to be totally legal in the UFC, prior to them cleaning up their act. In those days, one of the biggest marketing draws the promotion had was the idea that there were no rules, or barely any rules. And it's not like headbutting has no place in martial arts. Take Lithway, for example the Burmese style of fighting that is very similar to Muay Thai, but with the addition of legal headbutts. Oh, a fish hook is exactly what it sounds like. Few examples actually exist because this technique was never legal in MMA. But the idea is basically to stick your finger in your opponent's mouth and drag their cheek to the point of pain, so you can get yourself out of a dicey grappling situation. This one is just plain old dirty cheating. And though you hear fighters fish hooking every now and again, for the most part, a lot of them are accidental. A nasty move with no place in MMA in its modern form. We're not going to spend too much time on this next one, because even the thought of it gives us the chills. But yes, you are not allowed to bend, twist, or otherwise try to deliberately damage fingers and toes inside the octagon. Sure, sometimes this rule is broken, and other times toes and fingers just end up snapping. 
but any intentional or focused attack on small joints is totally prohibited. Yeah, doing your best impression of The Undertaker in the cage is going to get you into some hot water fast. And sure, pulling off the last ride, if you can manage it, is legal. And in some ways, Quentin Rampage Jackson's KO of Ricardo Arona is not too far off. But if you fancy hitting a tombstone pile driver on your opponent, that's just not going to fly. Striking your opponent down directly on their neck is an incredibly dangerous move that could have life-changing consequences for its victim. And for that reason, it's a total no-go zone. Groin shots. What more do we need to say? There's a reason they're outlawed these days, but you might not realize this, they weren't always illegal. Nope, in the UFC's earliest days, you could take a shot beneath the border and it was A-OK. -okay. Just look at Joe Sun versus Keith Hackney, for example. Hackney used several huge groin shots to his advantage, and the referee wasn't in a position to do anything about it. Well, as it turns out, those groin shots were well-placed as Joe's son would go on to get himself a life sentence in prison for some truly ghastly crimes. So, yeah, it's a terrible technique when it comes to pure fighting. But if anyone did have to absorb a series of hard shots to the groin, Joe's son is a great candidate. By law, you're not allowed to strike your opponent intentionally on the throat, which seems a little odd, right? Because of how close the throat is to the chin. I'm not actually sure how this rule is enforced, and from memory, I haven't ever seen a warning for someone striking to the throat. Because, well, if you have a clean shot on the throat, why not go for the chin instead? But hey, that's just us, and if the rules state it, it deserves to be mentioned in this video. It's pretty crazy to think of the wild attire that used to be prominent in the UFC. From the gi to wrestling shoes and even full-length pants, there really was less of a uniform feel within the sport. And sure, that had its merits, but these days every fighter wears more or less the same fight kit, with some subtle differences here and there. And while before, using the gi to your advantage was a huge part of any grappler's game, these days you can't even grab your opponent's shorts without getting a warning. Honestly, it's a fair change, and one that does make the sport better to watch. But even with that being the case, there was just something wild about watching bouts in the 90s and seeing fighters going to any means necessary to try and get out of the bad position. And I gotta say, those were the good old days, folks. Now, here's an interesting one that's in a bit of a gray area. Eye pokes or eye gouging of any kind were never legal in mixed martial arts. But the UFC certainly haven't taken their best possible route to eradicating them entirely. Their glove design in particular falls short of many other promotions' efforts, past and present. The glove doesn't really push the fingers to curve inwards, and that's something that causes more eye pokes in the UFC than anywhere else. Eye gouging, of course, is a different thing entirely, and while you do sometimes see them used sneakily to get out of submissions, it's a rarity and a nasty sight to behold. Okay, so being timid in a fight is not technically a move per se, but these days, the unlimited clock is a thing of the past, and if you're not active, the referee has every right to stand you up off the mat or give you a stern warning on the feet. In essence, if you're looking to run away from your opponent and not engage at all, you're going to find yourself in some hot water with the ref. Timidity is now punishable in MMA, which is a pretty good thing. Look, being tactful and taking a round off is one thing, but when you're actively trying to avoid engagement at any cost, that's just not an option in a live cage fight, I'm afraid. The next one is just plain stupid. The 12 to 6 elbow, or a downward elbow, is totally outlawed in the UFC and has been since the Wild West days of the 90s. The problem, again, is more of an aesthetic one, and supposedly, if you believe the old legend, this move was banned specifically after some athletic commission head watched a video of a martial arts master breaking blocks of concrete with a technique. It's also the reason John Jones is technically not an unbeaten fighter. A weird one, but a rule that doesn't appear to be changing anytime soon. You can kick a man in the face, punch him in his liver, elbow his ribcage. But if you land a punch on the back of his head, the ref is going to caution you. And to be honest, it's a weird rule, but I guess it does make sense. Skull isn't quite a stick on its back, but with that being said, head kicks that loop around the back or any straight punches that connect by accident are totally fine. If you throw an overhand while your opponent is trying to set up a spin and it lands on the back of their head, it's totally legal. 
so yeah, it's a rule that's going to stand the test of time, but there's always going to be exceptions to it. And finally, we come to the obvious one, the rule that MMA would never ever allow, right? Well, as it turns out, the UFC back in its earliest days did not actually outlaw hair pulling, but the practice was frowned upon, which is something, I guess. But even the great Hoist Gracie was not above using every possible tool to his advantage. And when he took on Kimo Leopoldo, he grabbed a hold of his opponent's distinctive ponytail, using it from his guard to maintain control in key moments. And that sounds like a dirty move, right? Well, that was just the culture at the time, and Gracie can't be blamed for taking advantage. He won the fight in the end, and according to the rule set being used, he did so fairly. Thankfully, the sport has moved on from this era, and these days anything resembling the pulling of hair is totally illegal. Number 11. Hair Pulling Hair pulling is a move that belongs to the streets. It is by no means a martial arts move, but can be used regardless and very effectively. If allowed inside the octagon, it would prove disadvantages especially to fighters who sport a longer hairstyle. Hair pulling is presently an illegal move in the UFC and MMA as a whole, but that was not always the case because MMA legend Hoyce Gracie was one of the very first to ever use the move in 1994 against Kimo Leopoldo. Knowing he represents the legacy, the family, as well as a UFC top. Let's see Hoist if he can start maneuvering those legs. He's been compared, Jim, in your own work. Being on his back, Hoist was getting dominated by Leopoldo, but the jiu-jitsu legend avoided some significant ground to pound thanks to the hair pull and eventually won the bout via an armbar. Number 10 Biting it's a no-brainer that biting your opponent is against the rules. An MMA fighter got disqualified from a novelty match in a miniature cage because he wouldn't stop biting his opponent. As he was taking a page out of Mike Tyson's rulebook, veteran Mike Kyle was nearly caught red-handed biting Wes Sims at UFC 47. After Kyle secured a first-round knockout, a befuddled Sims protested that the victor had taken a liking to his chest. Video evidence would prove that Sims had significant teeth marks on his body. Number 9. Fish Hooking It's a given that this technique is banned just by the name. Among the banned techniques is a fish hook, which essentially sees a fighter insert their fingers into the mouth or nose of their opponent and pulling. However, this highly unsavory technique has been used in the UFC, and surprisingly enough, the incident in question didn't take place in the promotion's dark ages. Instead, it happened on a 2014 UFC Fight Night card between veteran Brian Caraway and prospect Eric Perez. Number 8. Eye Gouging Eye gouging is a pretty serious issue in MMA. Just ask John Jones. Lee Jingliang had one of the more dirty and obvious intent against Jake Matthews. From guard now, it's tight! This might be it! And here's the foul right there oh, who somehow thought it was a great idea to gouge his opponent's eye MMA star Priscilla Cachoeira was caught trying to gouge her opponent's eye twice during their clash at UFC 269 number seven stomps Yes, stomping on an opponent's head or body is definitely not legal anymore, but they did cause some insane knockouts. This was very common in Pride in a lot of Japanese promotions. Heck, Shogun Hua destroyed Cyril Diabate with them and even Hiromitsu Kanehara in his Pride stint. Nowadays, if a fighter tries to stomp on an opponent, it has ended with the DQ or points deducted, depending on the condition of the fighter on the receiving end. Number 6. Knees to Grounded Opponent In other MMA promotions, knees, kicks, and stomps to a grounded opponent's head are completely legal. Look no further than the weekend at UFC 259, where UFC bantamweight champion Piotr Jan delivered a brutal knee to a grounded Aljamain Sterling's head. Look at him just pressing on the head here. That, Stop! Oh, that's illegal. The fight was stopped by referee Mark Smith, Jan was disqualified, and Sterling was declared the new UFC bantamweight paper champion. Number 5. Soccer Kicks We've seen this plenty of times. In MMA, a soccer kick is a term used to describe leg strikes to a downed opponent. They used to be a commonplace in Japan when pride was still alive and well, but times have changed, MMA has become more mainstream and less brutal. In the co-main event of one fighting championship show, Zora Baba Moreira knocked out former UFC star Roger Huerta with a vicious soccer kick to the side of his face and neck. Huerta was on his knees, dazed and confused, the fight could have been stopped long before the kick had landed. Moreira himself looked hesitant to even deliver the blow. And let's throw this dude in there. Number 4. Low Blows 
groin strikes are outrageous, but are accidental. However, just like other moves on this list, which are now deemed illegal in the UFC, they were legal in the organization at one point in time. Oh, oh that, that is allowed in this competition. That is brutal. Ah. A famous incident involving a fighter handing out groin strikes in the UFC is a 1994 fight between Keith Hackney and Joe Sun. After getting locked in a partial guillotine by Sun, Hackney resorted to at least a dozen dick punches before getting his neck free. He eventually won the fight soon after submission. While groin punches have now become almost absent from the UFC, we do see groin kicks every now and then, but as an occupational hazard rather than a malicious plan. Fighters who are on the wrong end of accidental groin kicks are given a decent amount of time to recover. Number 3. Pile Driving Pile driving is also known as spiking your opponent on their head. This is legal in WWE, obviously, and was legal in Pride, but it's not legal in the UFC. Fighters rarely, if ever, get scolded for this because it is so uncommon. Even if it does happen, the best a ref can do is say not to do it again. Heck, even Bob Sapp had used this move back in the day. Number 2 Rabbit Punches Another one of the top things you'll see happen in a fight is the fighter getting warned not to punch the back of the head. One of the most notable examples of punching the back of the head was Brock Lesnar's first fight against Frank Mir. The big question is, He's taking will some Lesnar punches here. just overpower Mir? Where he was deducted one point and restarted standing up. The stoppage in the action led to Mir having a chance to recover and Lesnar's eventual loss in the fight. Number 1 Headbutting Headbutts were once legal in older organizations, but in almost every MMA organization today, an instance of this was Hodger Gracie's fight against Muhammad Lawal, where Gracie was rocked by a headbutt that the referee didn't notice due to how fast it happened. And Davies complaining to the referee, but... Oh, and that was a headbutt, clear as day by Ant Davies. In another instance, it's hard to do triangle jokes because she can't close the distance. Final 10 seconds, and it ends with a flurry. And hold on, Kyle Cardinal's going to call stop. This Alaskan fighter took exception to Andrew McKay's hair pulling antics during their World Series of Fighting 18 bout. Towards the end of the first round, right out of the blue and with McKenzie wailing on his stricken opponent, he launched into a diving header into McKay's skull. The referee immediately called the DQ. In a sport as wildly unpredictable as MMA, there's bound to be a few fights that leave you scratching your head wondering what did I just watch. When it comes down to these MMA fights, we seem to think we've seen it all until something new springs up on us and we literally have no clue how to react. But things we don't usually see as often are disqualifications. This could be crotch shots, knees to the head, or even wearing some sort of strange attire. We have comprised a list of many times where fighters decided they were going to risk it all to make the fight go their way. Or they did something that they thought was a good idea that later ended up making them look like a douche. So without further ado, this is the MMA fighters that immediately got disqualified. Number 10, Hector Lombard. The middleweight bout was part of the preliminary card of UFC 222 event at T-Mobile Arena in Las Vegas. After Dalloway landed a body kick just before the horn, Lombard landed a right jab then a massive left hand. It landed to the body, we're right back. Oh! Joe, Hector Lombard appeared to land a strike after the final horn. Yeah, I want to hear it. It de definitely. In a nutshell, Hector Lombard landed two punches after the bell had sounded and ref had called time. And after the punch landed, CB Dalloway was flattened to the ground as Hector Lombard continued to point at him as walking away. Number 9, Piotr Jan. Aljamain Sterling is a new UFC bantamweight champion, but the circumstances surrounding his title clenching performance were anything but usual. Sterling absorbed an illegal knee from Jan of round 4 and was deemed unable to continue by referee Mark Smith. Look at him just pressing on the head here. That, stop! Oh, that's illegal! Tore. His knee was down. The final sequence occurred as the clock ticked down around 4, with Sterling clearly down on a knee after a failed takedown attempt. Smith warned Jan of his opponent's down status. Despite the referee's warnings, Jan delivered a knee straight to the head of Sterling. Upon impact, Sterling showed signs of injury as he rolled around on the cage and tried to sit up. Only to return to a lying position on the mat, Smith called for the cage side doctor. Number 8. Mike Kyle 
Mike Kyle landed a beautiful kick to the face of former WEC heavyweight champion Brian Olsen, knocking him out cold in the main event at the Tachi Palace Hotel and Casino. There was only one problem. Olsen was on his knees and kicking to the head of a grounded fighter's legal. Olsen, Kyle giving his back, looking to try and get up. He gets up oh, and shakes him. That hurt. Oh, Kyle made matters even worse by continuing to strike his fallen opponent while referee Josh Rosenthal vainly attempted to pull him away. It was only when referee Herb Dean, who was not working the fight, came to his aid and the officials were able to get restrained Kyle. Number 7. Drew Chapman At LFA 36, Chapman won his fight via knockout against Irvin's Ayala. With Ayala unconscious and lying face down, Chapman celebrated the victory by doing a front flip off of Ayala's back. His win was quickly overturned into a disqualification because he struck his opponent after the bell. The bizarre clip was everywhere by the next morning, with takes ranging from outrage to confusion. An apologetic Chapman told MMA Fighting that emotions were running high as a pro MMA debutante and essentially he didn't know what he was doing in that sequence. Chapman, who was 23, was suspended 90 days by the California State Athletic Commission and his pay was withheld per commission disqualification rules. Number 6. Gilbert Ivel this is all common sense. No matter if an official is doing a poor job or a fighter is frustrated, there is no cost to deck a referee. There is no reasonable expectation for the official to be prepared for such an occurrence. But that is exactly what Ivel did in 2004 at Fight Festival 12. The referee interjected himself in between the fighters multiple times. Ivel grew frustrated with the process, then out of nowhere he plastered the referee with the left hand that sent him to the mat. And to top it all off, Ivel kicked the man while he was down. Number 5. Konstantin Gluhov During a bout against Latvian fighter Konstantin Gluhov at M1 Challenge 44 event in November of 2013, Gazayev was awarded the victory via disqualification after Gluhov landed an illegal kick to his grounded opponent. However, some have suggested that the fault lies with Gazayev, who spent the majority of the bout in a three-point stance instead of fighting. Number 4. Austin Batra Odds are you haven't heard of Austin Batra before. The amateur MMA fighter isn't a household name, but he gained notoriety for all the wrong reasons. Batra won the BFL welterweight title for less than a second. He scored a highlight reel knockout over Perry Hayer to win the strap, however at the same moment he lost it. He pumped the right hand to fake a punch before following it up with a seismic left hook that landed squarely on the chin. His adversary was rendered unconscious before he fell to earth. Unfortunately, as the referee was stepping in to award him the KO victory, Bachar did something totally brainless. He leapt into the air and landed a flying double axe handle strike on his downed opponent over the referee. Number 3. Amadosh Ferrari Polish welterweight fighter Amadeusz Roslik snatched a DQ defeat from the jaws of victory after he was disqualified for landing a thunderous soccer kick on his opponent during an MMA event in Poland on that Saturday night. <laughs> Roslik threw the illegal soccer kick after knocking opponent Adrian Polanski to the canvas with an expertly timed overhand right during the Fame MMA 7 event in Warsaw promoting the cage side officials to disqualify him moments after he celebrated what he thought was a win in the Polish capital. Number 2. Nick Serra There's a reason this was Nick Serra's last professional MMA fight. The younger brother of former UFC welterweight champion Matt Serra, Nick didn't exactly make the Serra name proud against Matt Mikowski. There's a kick behind the knee again, and Serra just falling yes. down. Falling. The referee's already warned him, and if he doesn't come Mine up, is one point. Hey, he's going to one point. point. After getting beat up then trying to avoid Mikowski, Sarah was ultimately disqualified after he dropped to the mat and decided to not engage with his opponent at all. The official decision? Disqualification because he wouldn't get up from the butt scoot. And last but not least, number 1 John Jones. Jones lost to Hamill after landing illegal downward elbows on Hamill in a December 2009 fight at the Ultimate Fighter 10 finale. Jones was disqualified and has not experienced the defeat since. Elbow! 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 Elbow!
off to six. The up due to attention of elbows, there's been a disqualification of Johnny Bones Jones. Somewhat out of nowhere though, White said he'd had a conversation with the Nevada Athletic Commission, which initially declined to hear an appeal of the result to have the loss taken off Jones's record. How that played out remained to be seen, but it gave Hamill an opportunity to insert himself in the narrative. The veteran fighter who was 2-3 since his final UFC bout in October of 2013 took to social media and said he would happily rematch Jones. He also took a shot by insinuating that Jones wasn't clean for their matchup. He's blocking them. Yep. That's He's doing a good job. Elbow, stop, Big stop. elbows. Can't no, you elbow, can't stop. do 12 to 6. John Bones Jones was disqualified for the use of the elbows at the Ultimate Fighter 10 finale, where he was well on his way to earn a TKO victory over Matt Hamill. But Steve Mazzagatti came in and stopped the fight, handing Bones his first and only loss. 